Jimmy's here. I can hear Jimmy. <laughs> we want to welcome you to our services today and uh, appreciate uh, everyone's cooperation and working with uh, our door greeters and seating and all of that. I know whenever you look at this, you think, man, we've got plenty of seating, and we do. Uh, but if we don't capitalize uh, on, on our seating and all of that, why it, it, it can fill up really fast, faster than we wanted to, because we want, uh, of course, our services to continue to grow, and we feel like that they will as far as time goes. Uh, people become more comfortable and, and just get a little bit more peace and assurance of knowing uh, that things are safe and things that are improving and all of that. So uh, we certainly appreciate uh, all that you uh, do and, and I appreciate you being here uh, in services today especially. It's so good uh, to be able to see you face to face, uh, see your smiles, uh, see your other things like Ron. I, I don't know. Does Ron smile? He does, occasionally. I, I've seen Ron smile. Uh, but anyway, Ron, it's good to see you as well. Just everybody, it's always good uh, to just know that God's in our midst and that God's moving. Uh, let me make mention of just a couple of things. Uh, if you did not get one of these last week or you have not filled one in uh, yet, these are available at the uh, door. And uh, we, I don't know what I just did, but I did the wrong thing. So I'll fix that in a minute, apparently. Uh, anyway, uh, there we go. We, uh, we, we're we trying to update our church, uh, just data information uh, on our congregation. And so uh, if you did not get one of these last week, uh, make sure that you get one. Fill out all the information uh, on their accurate phone numbers, email addresses, uh, on and on we can go that, that information's on there. Uh, there's some lines on there. Uh, that may be a little bit confusing, uh, but really uh, all we're asking for and looking for is uh, essentially if you are a member uh, or just a church family. So uh, down at the bottom, uh, you'll see uh, where it says member, so month and year that you join. Uh, it's kind of what that is for. If you can remember or you can get close, it don't have to be exact, but it can be close. Uh, and then if it just says church family, uh, that means that you have not placed your membership here, uh, but this is your church family and when you started attending, uh, and then of course visitor uh, if you're visiting as well. And so uh, that information will help us out tremendously uh, in updating our records and getting our information uh, accurate. So uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Also, I have a thank you card here. Uh, dear church family, thank you for your prayers and support during our time of sorrow with the loss of our son Steve. Uh, sincerely, Junior and Vagna uh, and Brenda uh, Bench. And so Junior and Vagna, it's good to see you guys back there. Uh, they were... Uh, uh, supposedly fishing last Sunday or last weekend anyway. Uh, I don't think they got a lot of fishing in because it was too cold. Uh, but they had gone to see their daughter uh, at, at her house and so it's good to have Junior and Badna here and uh, we've been praying for you and, and certainly praying for others uh, that have lost loved ones through the course of the pandemic as well. Uh, it's just been, it's been different uh, for sure. Uh, hard to console, hard to uh, do all those things. So we appreciate you being here. Uh, we are sending out our prayer uh, request via email. Uh, we're trying to eliminate as much uh, passing out and information, bulletins, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, just trying to eliminate that as much as we can to keep, uh, again, the social distancing and looking at recommendations that have been given, uh, not just to churches, but universally. Uh, just trying to abide by those as much as we can. Uh, so if you are not getting our email and you want our prayer list, uh, let us know or, or on that sheet. Uh, make sure you get you put your email address on there and we'll, we'll include you uh, on that as well. But uh, uh, there are a couple of additions to the prayer request uh, that we want to make mention of this morning. Uh, Mark Lewis uh, uh, is back in the hospital again. Uh, he uh, is the pastor there at the Church of God uh, here in West Plains, and he's having 
uh, some issues that have kind of come up again. His heart uh, rhythm or, or pulse or rate or whatever was, was kind of going weird. And so uh, they went ahead and admitted him. Of course, he's battling cancer and uh, is on some medications for that. And so pray for Mark. Uh, and then also, if you would, pray for Darlene Wilson's brother. Uh, his name is Dwayne uh, Barton. Uh, he uh, was uh, thrown off of a horse yesterday and is in uh, Mercy Hospital in Springfield and uh, has fractured or broken his pelvis, I think, uh, and then torn other ligaments and tendons and whatever else. Uh, they're, they're a little unsure of all of the things just simply because, again, no family can go in. Uh, and uh, Dwight's wife is a nurse, and she was actually uh, in Georgia, working in Georgia because they needed nurses there, and so she was out of town. And uh, So again, a lot, lot to that story, but uh, if you would, uh, pray for uh, Dwayne. Again, that's Darlene Wilson's, uh, Darlene Wilson's brother. Um, yes. Okay, Gary DeBoard has cancer. All right, let's pray. Let's pray for him. Any other prayer requests anyone has before we pray? Yes. A friend of mine her name is uh, Carol Clock, and she's waiting test results as well. Okay. Probably have surgery. All right, let's remember that. Reveal. That has that he is. How long has he been in the hospital now, Bill? Three months, uh, and it's from a ruptured appendix. Uh, it's where it all originated from, and so wow. Let's let's pray. Let's pray for him continually and for the family. Well, services can start now. One of our singers is here. I'm glad to see that. <laughs> Some of these parents ought to be whipped. <laughs> he does take after me. I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll pass up to that one. You bet. You bet. Uh, anyway, let's stand together if you would. And uh, remain standing because we've got something fun for the kids and for you uh, this morning. And Tommy's going to come. And he's got a couple of announcements. And uh, so remain standing uh, after we pray. And uh, join in with us. Uh, worship us. Have fun with us. Smile a little bit. Uh, but most of all, let's let's know that God is alive and well, and He's right here with us uh, every step of the way. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Stan Taylor, if you would. Brother Stan, would you care to lead us in prayer, please? For your time, most gracious Heavenly Father, once again as we come before thee here at this church, welcome your Lord. We thank thee for each one that is here this day. The prayer request for those that have been hospitalized and sick, we just ask your Lord's special.
do like a Friday through Sunday uh, with the kids. Obviously, I can use all the sponsors. My goal is to get a one sponsor to two kids ratio. Now, when you have like the McGinley's and the Rogers, they have like 48 kids. <laughs> but, uh, so if you want to go, uh, I'll have more specifics down the road, but just be in prayer. Uh, it was a big decision. It was uh, like literally one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. So, with that, with that being said, um, God's still going to be glorified. He's still amazing. We're still going to come together as, as a youth group. We're still going to glorify Him. Uh, so that's what I've got. Pre-teen camp is still in the works as of right now. We're still looking. We're assessing this whole COVID situation, and we're going to see how things look in the next month, and we'll make decisions from there. With that being said, all right, little kids. All right, and adults too, okay? Uh, who was at Vacation Bible School this past year? One. Okay, awesome. Well then. Uh, so, as this has mentioned in the past, we are going to factor in some things for the kids to do when it comes to worship and stuff like that. So, we are actually bringing a dance. Okay, I know we're for real Baptists. We don't really partake in that kind of stuff. You were allowed to move your dips today, all right? Side to side only. So, uh, I've been running, I've been biking, my legs are sore, so if you see me squinting, just go with it, okay? But, so I'm going to teach you some dance moves real quick, okay? Kids, you may remember this song. So, it's going to start out, uh, before I go, 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 I stop, okay? So how it's going to work is before I go, 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 I stop. Okay, so you guys do it, ready? You guys stand up, you try it? Ready? So this before I go, 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 I stop. Before I go, 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 I stop. Oh, okay, I'm really winning already. Right okay. uh, <laughs> Good news is he doesn't have to sing. Yeah. Uh, and then the next part is going to be before I run, 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 I walk. So you're going to run. Before I run, 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 I walk. You can do it twice, okay? Because then you'll run into a chair. Big deal, lawsuits, it's just front things, okay? The last thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna put this down real quick. Before I split, 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 and if I'm parked next to you, you go back to back, I chill. Before I split, 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 I chill, okay? Now, another thing, last thing, and then, we'll, then we're gonna go, okay? There's gonna be some rock and roll music, I know, I know, get over it, this is my time. All right, so you some rock and roll music, you know, bang your heads, go crazy, rock out, okay, for Jesus. All right, only rock out for Jesus. So, you guys ready? All three of you are yes, okay. All right, north, south, east, west. Or I 
really uh, one of my uh, COVID-19 uh, memorable moments. And uh, I, uh, there's just a number of times throughout the course of uh, us not being able to have services and having church that um, just there was just some of those God moments that were just exceptional for me. And so uh, we were about maybe a week in uh, to uh, no church. And so uh, we were making calls and we were trying to do, actually we were trying to get ready for Easter and how that was going to look and some different things. Uh, long story short, uh, I think I had done two online messages. And uh, you, you see the meme uh, that says, and just like that, my preacher became a televangelist. Uh, that's how I felt. Uh, really, really bad, and, and like, and so uh, I was carrying all these emotions, and you know, am I doing it right? And is it okay? Does it sound all right? Uh, do I look like a freak? You know, trying to talk to this camera, and, and so all these emotions are going on, and, and I get a call from nobody else other than Harry Carter, and Harry calls me, and he, and here's here's how he starts this conversation. Harry says, Brother Dennis, I need to talk to you. I said, Brother Harry, it's good, good to hear from you. What's going on? Because I know, uh, you know, uh, his, his wife, uh, she's, she's been battling some uh, issues, pneumonia, some different things uh, like that. Betty's, Betty's health wasn't always real good. I knew his health wasn't real good. And so Harry says this, and you just got to know Harry. But Harry says, Brother Dennis, your job is in jeopardy. So all of those, you know, anxieties that I had about being a televangelist, it all of a sudden, like, this weight fell on me. And I was freaking out because I thought maybe I had said something really odd or maybe it just looked weird or what, you know. And so uh, Harry, Harry says, Brother Dennis, I'm going to take over your job. He said, throughout the course of his two weeks, he said, every single person I have talked to, we have, we, the conversation has led to the Lord. And he said, I've been preaching to everybody I see. And I said, Harry, take my job. You can have it. <laughs> you know, I said, you got it. But he was, he was so excited. And so anyway, we were talking about, you know, what the future holds, what's things going to look like, what's the church going to look like. And so I was on my back porch. And I was facing uh, the west on my back porch, and I was kind of facing this way, uh, talking to him. And, and so uh, in the middle of our conversation, I, I turned, and whenever I turned, I turned to the east, and this is what I saw. I don't know if you can see that very well, but that's, that's a rainbow uh, oh, that, that came over into the east of my house. And this clicker is... Not clicking very well. Uh, so anyway, there, there was a rainbow off to the east. I could see both sides. I tried to get a picture of both sides, but I couldn't get it. It was too far spread. Uh, but whenever I see that, I said, Brother Harry, you will not believe what, what I'm seeing. He said, Brother Dennis, I see a rainbow. I said, Brother Harry, that's what I see too. And it just, it, I mean, it was one of those Reminders. Remember the rainbow? God put it in the sky for Noah as a reminder and as, as a remembrance that he would no longer destroy all of earth in the same fashion. And so I, I see that and it was just, it was really uh, just one of those neat God moments for me uh, and for Harry uh, that we, we were able to see that rainbow to remind us that in the midst of of chaos and confusion and unknowns, God's still watching and he still remembers us each individually. Uh, so if you see Harry, next time you see Harry, call him the preacher, telling me he got my job and we're missing him. He, he needs to come in and fill my shoes for a little while. Uh, but anyway, I was, I was tickled to hear that. Uh, we're going to have our praise team come. And uh, we're going to do a couple of songs this morning. Uh, and I think that first song uh, is one that, uh, that we all know very well, good hymn. Uh, so if you would, stay with us again and uh, worship with us uh, as we uh, sing these songs.
will and do as you want them to do as uh, to inspire your word for this whole country. We just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you a passage of scripture to start our service. In Psalm 62, it says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defender. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, my rock and my strength. My refuge is in God. This next verse is a verse that I've heard quoted probably as many times as I've heard any other scripture, uh, but I've always heard it uh, at a funeral. Uh, and it's always been quoted by Brother Glenn, who was... Uh, our senior pastor for so many years. But he would share this with the family and in their time of greatest grief, the unknowns of the loss of a loved one. Uh, and, and the scripture is this. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is a refuge for us. God is a refuge. I want to continue our series entitled Spiritual Lessons from COVID-19. Now, we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit, and we're going to do a little sub-series on another subject or another title uh, that actually I started Wednesday night. For those of you that uh, watched our Wednesday night devotion, uh, we talked about what will be the new norm. Uh, what, what can we expect? What can we anticipate uh, the new norm? How long are we going to be in the multi-purpose building? How long will we have to keep uh, the six-foot spacing? How long? You know, we, we've got all of those unknowns. And so I've heard, I've heard this from uh, different individuals that have uh, experts that have lectured uh, on just everyday life. Uh, I've heard individuals lecture on the financial uh, outcome and the financial future, uh, and, and I've heard individuals talk about this in the church culture and the church life. What is the new norm? What is that going uh, to look like? And so I began to think about individuals in the Bible that had major life events that transformed or changed their perspective and changed their life from that point forward. And so last Wednesday, I, I did a little lesson on the two men that were on the road to Emmaus. And these two men that were on the road to Emmaus, they were talking together about all of the events that had just unfolded. Jesus, in the latter end of his life, had went into the garden to pray. He had been arrested. He had healed the man whose ear Peter had cut off. He had been taken before numerous religious and governmental officials. He had been stripped. He had been beaten. He had been mocked. He had the crown of thorns placed upon his head. He carried a sign that said, King of the Jews. And inevitably, they took him to the cross. They hung him, and they killed him. After his death, the time of the feast was upon them, and they could not perform the traditional burial rituals that they had normally done. So they took him and they buried him in a borrowed tomb and they put the stone in front of the tomb and there were guards placed on both sides to make sure no one would come and steal the body away because he had predicted that in three days he would rise again. After those three days, some of the women had left to go and anoint Jesus' body because now the time of the feast was over and they could perform uh, the traditional rituals that they were accustomed to. And they wanted to 
give appropriate measures to their friend and what they believe to be the Son of God. And so whenever they came to the tomb, of course we know that the tomb, the, the stone had been rolled away. So they, they, they out of fear and anxiousness, try to peek in, and suddenly they see an angel. And the angel says to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He who you seek is alive. The women run back to the disciples, and those who are congregated together, these two men being in that number. And they said, Jesus is gone. His body is not in the tomb. Peter and John, they rush and run to the tomb. They peek inside, and sure enough, they find the grave clothes folded and neatly placed where the body of Jesus once was. Now, there is a, 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 a confusion of what is coming next. They go back to meet with the others. They're, they're there together. And these two men are on this road and they're talking about all of the life events that had just taken place. It was all that any of the believers could talk about. There was three things that we can learn from these men on the road to Emmaus. Number one, it's all they could talk about. How many of you are tired of people talking about the coronavirus? <laughs> tired of hearing it on the news? Tired of hearing what, you know, tired of talking about it? We're in a situation similar to those that were on the road to the base. It's all we can talk about. It's all we can think about. It's all that's on people's minds. Very similar to this scenario. Not only that, there was a third man that heard them talking and joined themselves to these two followers of Jesus. And he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And he says, Dude, have you been so isolated? Sound familiar? Have you been so isolated that you've not heard about what they did to Jesus? How they crucified him? How they buried him? And now we just got word that he's no longer in the tomb. And they begin to guess, rationalize, and, and try to figure out what has happened and what the future holds. What's next? What will be the new norm since Jesus is no longer there? And so they're talking with this third man. And they said, hey, they said, we thought Jesus was the next king of Israel. We thought he was coming to establish a new kingdom where we no longer had to deal with all of these other kings, all this other rhetoric that's going on government-wise, religious-wise. We're tired of it all. We thought he was coming to establish a new kingdom. Besides all of that, this is the third day, and we got word that he's not there, but we've not seen him. We don't know where he's at. We don't know if somebody stole his body. We don't know what the future holds. And it's at that point that they're beginning to lose hope. Jesus wasn't the king that they thought he was going to be. Now it had been three days since he'd been buried in the tomb, and now they've not seen him in this triumphal way that they thought it should happen. And so they're rationalizing, they're guessing, and as they begin to leave the facts, they start losing hope. And it's that point the third man starts with Moses, and goes through all the prophets and starts sharing scripture with them about the Messiah, the coming Savior, and how that he was not coming to create a new kingdom. 
kingdom, but that his kingdom was in heaven. And that he was making a way and paving a way for men to escape the death that is inevitable in this life and have hope of eternity through the sacrifice that the Messiah would make. And it was at that moment that Scripture, truth, began to be shared with them that their eyes were open and they recognized the third man as Jesus himself. And just like that, Jesus disappeared. And the two men said, were not our hearts burning within us as he was sharing truth of Scripture with us? We need to understand that Scripture always sets things straight. It always makes things that are confusing and unknown instead of wondering and guessing and losing hope. Maybe we should just put our trust and our confidence in an almighty God that knows all and sees all. I was thinking about this new norm and thinking about what the future is going to look like for the church, what it's going to look like for my family, what it's going to look like for our kids and our grandkids and on and on. What, what would life look like and what can I learn from Scripture that will help me in understanding God's greater plan? And I thought of that rainbow that I seen whenever I was talking to Harry. And I thought about Noah. Noah had one of the probably most life-altering circumstances you could possibly ever imagine. Right? Here Noah is. He is a descendant of a descendant of a descendant that goes straight back to Adam and Eve. And Noah knows all of his family and everyone that was alive at that time, though there were thousands, they, they could trace each other's lineage back to each other. And so he was dealing with family. And here's what the Bible says about man in the days of Noah. Their minds and their hearts and their thoughts were evil continually. This is the time, this is the era in which Noah lived. Man's heart, man's thoughts, everything that was going on was evil continually. But Noah is described as a man that walked with God. He's described as a man of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 11 probably says it best in describing Noah in this way. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to save of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah, by faith, being in a circumstance where he did not know what the future held. All he knew was this. God came to him and said, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Because man's heart is evil continually, I am going to destroy everything. Now I want you to think about this. We're worried, and, and I don't mean to belittle, and I certainly don't want to, to offend anyone in any way. But I'm just telling you, we are worried about some minuscule things in comparison to what Noah was dealing with. He had the information resting on his shoulders that all of humanity was going to be destroyed except for those 
those that were on the boat that God told him to build. And Noah, with this uncertainty, with this unknown adventure, and not knowing what the new norm would be like, he began to build a boat. But here's the unique thing about the story of Noah. God said, Noah, I want you to build a boat with these dimensions. I want it to be so high. I want it to have so many layers. I want it to be so long. I want it to be so wide. I want it to have one window. I want it to have a door. Here's how you make the door. And here's what kind of wood you're going to use. Here's what you're going to put on the outside of it. God designed the ark and said, Noah, build it just like this. Because it is going to have to withstand torrential rains. For 40 days and 40 nights, it's going to rain like never before. Even the fountains of the deep are going to open up. So water is going to come from the sky. Water is going to come from the earth. And it is going to flood the entire earth so much so there will not be one, one speck of earth shown. Water will surround the earth. And every living thing with the breath of life within it will be destroyed other than those who are in this boat that you're going to build. And with all of these instructions but unknowns, Noah begins to build and do exactly as God commanded him. Let me just say this. If you want to know what the new norm is, this is a great opportunity for every single one of us that, are, that have our faith in God, that trust Him for our very souls, what a great time it is for us to be a little bit like Noah and just be obedient to the commands of God. And you won't have near as much anxiety about the new norm. If we have to have six foot in between us, Every Sunday at church, that's the new norm. But if God is in our life and he's in our worship, what difference does it make? We may not be able to sit uh, together like we once sat together. And if that is the case, if God is in control and God is sovereign and our faith is anchored in him and that's the new norm, that's okay. Why? Because we're being obedient to Christ's command. And His command is not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, but coming together to worship Him. But then even greater than that, telling others about our faith in Jesus. This ark that Noah built, it was unique. The circumstances in which Noah was building it was unique. You see, we don't really know all about it, but, but there's never anything really recorded about rainfall. What is rain? God said the skies are going to open up and water is going to come out of it, but I don't know that he'd ever seen rain before. The, the fountains of the deep were going to open up and water is going to flow out of the ground like Noah had never seen it before. But he knew that he had to be obedient to God, and so he started cutting wood. He started nailing the wood. He started structuring this vessel that was unprecedented. Now, I don't know if you can see this or not. This is actually the recreation of Noah's Ark over in Kentucky. These are people down here. I mean, have any of you guys want to see this thing? Okay. So you, you know how big it is, right? It's huge. These are people down here in this corner. These are cars back here in this corner. That gives you some idea of the magnitude and size of this vessel that God designed 
to endure floods. Now I want you to think about this. Have any of you like watched water rise or maybe had watched a stick or watched a, a little boat or something or whatever it is that's floating in the creek as it rises? It, it'll, it'll come up and it'll float and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit the shore and then it's going to bounce back. And then it's going to hit a rock and then it's going to bounce back. This boat, as the waters begin, it's not like it was immediately put in 20 foot of water. It slowly rose. And, and so this boat was going to endure some of the most treacherous things. It was beating against the, the ground under the water until the waters got deep enough that it could actually float and be buoyant. It was bouncing off all types of things that were around it. And God designed it, and Noah built it, and it withstood the test. There was only one boat or ship that came to my mind whenever I was thinking about a comparison to Noah's Ark. And that was the Titanic. Now the Titanic was built as one of the phenomenons of its generation. What was it known as? The what? The unsinkable ship, right? It, it was undestructible. Man had designed it. They had went to great lengths. They had used the best steel. They had used the most elaborate things they could imagine to make sure that this vessel would endure any type of weather, any type of hardship, and it was going to go on voyage for three weeks. And they made all the preparations. They, they designed it, they engineered it, uh, and it was, and then the media took over. Yes, there was media back then. And they built it up. And all around the world, it was known that there was a ship being built that was going to take voyage, and for a certain expense, you could be the first on board for the voyage of the Titanic. And they came all around the world to take the first voyage on the unsinkable ship. And they got on it, and we know the rest of the story. The first encounter with an obstacle, an iceberg, it ruptured the bow, it began to sink, it literally broke in half and sunk to the bottom of the sea. Now what kind of comparison can we give to the Titanic and the Ark? One of them was built by man. One of them was designed by God. The one designed by man was four times higher, taller than the ark. The Titanic was nearly twice as long as the ark. And it was approximately 20 feet wider than the ark. This vessel, the Titanic, it was prepared for a three-week voyage. It had all the necessities, all the food, all the provisions. Believe it or not, toilet paper was an issue. <laughs> they wanted to make sure they had enough. And so for 3,547 people, this ship that was four times taller, twice as long, and 20 feet wider had all the provisions necessary to take voyage and be the unsinkable ship. The ark, on the other hand, which was smaller, had to have these provisions. It had, a, had to have enough food and enough provisions and enough things on board to compensate for 50,000 plus animals. Two million insects and eight people. One built by man, <coughs> one
one built by God. The one in which had all the provisions to provide for man failed. The one who God designed sustained all of life as you and I know it. Because of the obedience of one man that was experiencing an unknown, unprecedented time of life that just wanted to do the will of God. I don't know if this makes sense to you, but for me, it made it very clear that I need to trust in God. When looking for the new normal and whatever the future holds, we must depend on God's provision, God's design. Because it's far better than man's design. Amen. We have to depend and trust in God. Now I want to I share a little illustration that might help you in understanding. Because Noah, with all these uncertainties, do you think Noah had some concerns? <laughs> all of humanity, all of life was on his shoulders. And I will guarantee you, he was a little worried. He was a little concerned about how things were going to be. But he overcame his worries and he trusted in God. How many of you think there are people that you know, whether in your family, whether at your workplace, or acquaintances that you come in contact that are worried about the new norm? Anybody? All of us. All of us can think of somebody that talks about you about all their concerns. And here's the great, here's what all of this is about. This is the irony of it all. You know what the entire shutdown of our world is about? Death. We're all concerned about dying. You know what Paul said? To die is to gain. What's the worry, Christian? Why, why are we so infatuated? Why is it all we talk about? You know, if we talked about Jesus as much as we talked about the coronavirus, God might be able to make some changes. But we have worry. And it's natural. I worry. I understand. It's a natural instinct. But we have worry. But we also have what is recognized as trust. Trust. Trusting in God. Trusting in His provision. The definition of worry would be simply this. Worry is... Oh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I knew I was. I clicked it too hard. I'm very impatient on this thing. So we'll get it right. Worry. Worry is when we are afraid or concerned because we don't know what's going to happen. The basic definition of worry, right? We're afraid or concerned because we don't know what's going to happen. Trusting God means that we remember God is in control and know that everything that we do not need to be afraid because God is taking care of us. So you have worry and you have trust. For the Christian, can both of them exist simultaneously? Can you be worried and at the same time have your complete and total obedience and confidence and trust in God? Well, let's see. If this doesn't work, I'm in trouble. If I make a mess, Parker's going to clean it up. <laughs> now, I made my trust red so you can see kind of the difference. But I'm going to pour these in together and try not to make a mess. Can trust and worry 
exist at the same time. You say, oh, wait a minute, you got more trust than you got worry. Okay, well, let's do that. Are they mixing?
can't come together. They've got to separate. You say, well, that, that's because you poured it in the way you poured it in. Well, let's, let's just make sure. Are you guys, Mallory, are you watching? All right. Let's just make sure because I don't want you to think I had some kind of magical trick or power up here. These are just facts. What are we going to do? Are we going to worry or are we going to trust? Well, Noah trusted God. With everything that was within him, he trusted God. Instead, he was obedient. Instead of worrying about the stock market, instead of worrying about how long or how it was going to impact and what the new norm was going to be, Noah just simply obeyed God and he was concerned for the protection of his family and the salvation of life. What should we be concerned about? There's a difference between worry and compassion. I can worry about my bank account. I can have compassion on the soul of man. We need to have compassion on the salvation of life. That should be our highest priority. And the way that we can change and, and proclaim the salvation of life is through Jesus Christ and Him alone. We can't do it any other way. Worries and trust. Can they be mingled in together? Now we have they separated yet? I haven't looked. I'm afraid to look. Nope. Separated ain't they? They can't be together. God wants us to trust Him. God needs us. Maybe now more than any other time in history, God needs the Christians to have absolute, total confidence in Him and Him alone. Let me close with these scriptures. What will the norm be like? I can't tell you, but I know, the, I know what I need to do. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. We have to trust him. With what? With all of our heart. And in, we, in doing so, we separate our fears and worries with our trust and confidence, and we now have a foundation. One last verse. 1 Peter 5, 7. I, I tell you, I've, I've reflected over the past eight weeks on a lot of things that I have learned over the course of my Christian life. And this verse is probably one of the anchors and pillars in any counseling that I do with any individual, whether it be for salvation, whether it be for marriage, whether it be for raising children, whether it be they on their deathbed or just sick in the hospital. This scripture is true for us all. In every gamut of our life, in all the uncertainties that life affords us and, and, and all of the, the new norm that we may be experiencing. The King James Version says, cast all of your fears upon him because he cares for you. God cares for you. God cares for the soul of men. Noah was more concerned. He preached righteousness to his family, to his friends, to his neighbors. He never quit until the door was shut. You ever thought about it, Noah? How am I going to get two of every kind of animal on the boat? As he's driving those nails, do you think that worried him? I'm sure he thought about it. He thought, well, God will have to provide did he, did he? Did he? Yes, he did. Every time God provides exactly what we need, when we need it, right on time, every time. Even whenever we don't know.
know or understand? No. Finding a new name is trust and confidence was in God. That's, that's what we must do. That's what's going to make our family, that's what's going to get us to safety, and that's what's going to get our friends and our family to safety, is our trust and confidence in God. It's the new norm for my life, and I hope it is for your life as well. Would you stand with me? And I want you to ask yourself this question, first and foremost. Am I right with God? Am I where God wants me to be? Am I listening? Am I obedient? Am I responding to God's command? Is my soul well with Him? You have to ask yourself that question first. After you've answered that question, then, and only then, after your trust and confidence is in Him, then those worries will be gone away and you'll be able to focus on what Noah focused on. The righteousness of God, the provision of God, the protection of God, the love and care of God. For your neighbors, your friends, your family that maybe aren't living a righteous life. It's your responsibility it's my responsibility to demonstrate and express our trust in God every single day. Would you bow your heads with me? Is it well with your soul? Father, have your way today. Whatever adjustments we need to make to our life, whatever the new norm is in this pandemic, Whatever you have in store, God help us to trust in you and you alone. Forgive us where we fail you and help us to be better, equipped and prepared to share your righteousness and your love. In Jesus' name, with your head bowed and eye closed, I hope that this song speaks right to your soul.